Hey, welcome back to the Crabby Dice. Today we're going to be looking at the game Vikings from Michael Kiesling. So the theme to this game is we're in charge of a Viking tribe and we're going to be exploring islands and gathering workers to help our tribe and so on. But you know what? It's mostly all abstracted. You're just going to be doing a lot of bidding on this wheel to get the tiles you really need to make the most points possible, right? So there's a point track and it is a Euro. All right, so this is gonna be the rules and setup breakdown video. Click the link below for my review and playthrough. Like usual, before we start, please like, subscribe and comment on my YouTube channel, that'll be fantastic, let's go. All right, welcome to the Viking setup. So this is pretty simple, uh, lay out your game board. You're gonna have a nice rondelle over here in the middle. Um, and what you're gonna do is these are called the island tiles and you're gonna have 72, so you're gonna make six stacks of 12 all right and then you're going to take the first stack and put it around the rondelle okay the only rule you really need to follow is that the ships all must be at the end of the rondelle track so you're going to put the zero at after one of the ships and then you're going to realign some of the island tiles uh, to make sure that all the ships are at the end something like that okay next you're going to go get your meeples all right and we're going to go get 12 meeples so shuffle it up Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. And now the way these are set up around the track is that you're gonna always follow this chart. Okay, so you're gonna put the blue ones out first. So starting always with the zero spot, put the, the blues, then you're gonna put the yellows, then the greens, and then the reds, lots of reds, then the blacks. And then the grays. All right, make sure to always follow this every single time. After that, let's look at our player board area. Everyone's going to get a player board. You're going to get a starting tile. You're going to tell by the back they have this little Viking icon on it. Okay, give out the first player marker. Everyone's going to start between twenty and thirty dollars. If you're three players, it's twenty-five. If you're two players or four players, it's going to differ by five up or down. Okay, and lastly, everyone's going to get a cube of their color. All right, uh, this is just to signify what color they are. And the other one is going to be on the 10 point spot over here because we could lose points. All right. And sort of the cubes just tell you what color you're going to be. Okay. Around the game board, you're just going to have your bag of meeples. You're going to use every round. You're going to have your money to exchange and uh, spend. And lastly, before we start, this is the setup for the base game. I'm going to talk about the advanced game at the end of this video. I'll show you how to set it up and what the rule changes are. All right, but for right now, let's just talk about the basic game. All right, let's talk about the rules to Viking. So at its core, this is a tile placement game, but you're going to be placing them on your own tableau. All right, but there's a whole funky purchasing mechanism before you get your tile. All right, so there's these 12 tiles around this rondelle type system here. And on your turn, you're going to grab a grouping and a grouping consists of both the tile and meeple at that location. All right, and the cost is also going to be displayed on the board. All right, once you buy your tile, you're going to add it to your player board area and then it'll jump onto the next player and then it'll jump onto the next player and you're going to keep doing that until all the tiles have been taken around the rondelle. There are 12 tiles divided by 4, 3, and 2 is an even number, so you're all going to end up with the same amount of tiles. All right. After that, depending on the round, you're going to do a, either a, a small scoring or a large scoring. So at the end of rounds 1, 3, and 5, there's small scorings and at the end of rounds 2, four and six there's going to be large scoring so the game's going to last six rounds at the end of six rounds you're going to do a one final end game scoring and whoever has the most points after that is going to win the game of vikings all right so i'm going to talk about the rules to the purchasing then i'm going to talk about the rules of the placement then we're going to talk about the special powers of the vikings and then at the end of this video i'm actually going to explain the advanced rules variant because these tiles are not used in the base game but you can sort of incorporate them to make it a more strategic game. All right, let's get started. All right, let's start off by talking about the rules of the purchasing wheel over here. Uh, there's only a couple of rules. First, when you're purchasing, you're really targeting a tile and a meeple of a priced uh, section of the wheel. So for example, if I wanted this combination here, it'll cost me eight. If I wanted this combination here, it'll cost me five. And if I wanted this combination, it'll cost me two, for example. Uh, you just take the combination, uh, and you pay the price into the bank and then I'll move on to the next player. All right, there's just a couple of rules in regards to this wheel. First rule, you can never take the spot on the, well, the zero combination if 
there's another spot with the same colored meeple as the zero space. So for example, somebody would have to buy this one before this one is taken. The only time that that rule is broken is if somebody really has no money, then you're forced to take the zero cost combination. All right, speaking about money and costs, at any point on your turn, if you're really strapped for cash, you can spend victory points for money. So for example, we start the game at 10, so I can spend five victory points for five coins if I wanted to. Um, if you are at zero, then you can't perform this ability. You just have no money. Okay. Okay. So you're all going to be purchasing tiles. Now there's a way for the actual wheel to rotate and lower costs of tiles. So I'll show you that right now. So let's say first player took this tile, second player took this tile, and third player took this combination. All right. Now, whenever the zero space combination is taken, the wheel is going to rotate. What's going to happen? It's going to go meet the next available tile. So it'll rotate like this. And as you can see, it's sort of lowered the price of all the upcoming tiles coming up. All right, and that will always happen. So let's say all of these have been taken in the future, then it's going to keep rotating. Okay, and that's basically all the rules in regards to the purchasing wheel here. All right, next let's talk about the placement rules of the tile. So this is a sort of tile laying section of the game. So once you take your combination, for example, if I take this combination for whatever reason, you must place the tile right away in your tableau with the meeple. So how this works is there's some placement rules. All right, so just FYI for the first round of the game, you are given this uh, starting tile and you have to play it either before or after you place your first tile. Uh, because this is a middle section, I'll probably decide to play it first and then add my middle section afterwards. All right, so placement rules, really simple. All the tiles have to sort of match, so land to land or water to water. Uh, you can't do something like water to land like this. And all the tiles have an orientation. I like to look at the bottom, there's always a white line. Uh, so you can't have tiles flipped over or vertical like this. It doesn't really make any sense. And there you go. All right, uh, so, you know, as long as you can draw path back to your main board it is legal placement so for example in a future turn uh, i can't have this tile out in the middle of the ocean i could actually connect it ocean to ocean over here water to water this is a legal placement oops now it's legal placement because i can draw a path back to my player board over here all right and i can add an end cap here or continue my islands over here and do whatever you like as long as all my tiles can draw a path back to your main board now, the only other exception to this is the boats. All right, boats must be played up here in the top row. And your first three boats must be played up here. All right, any combination you want. So your first one could go here, your second one could go here, and the third one can go here. If you fill up all three sections, then you can keep adding boats to the right over here. All right, so those are all the tile uh, placement rules. Now let's talk about the meeple placement. Okay, so... Meeple placement is pretty simple. If you do add the tile that you purchased in the same row of that meeple color, you can add that meeple straight to the island right away. All right. In any other scenario, the meeple is going to go to the boatsman up here. So for example, if I laid my first tile down here, all right, the meeple is going to go up here because it doesn't match the color of the Viking here. But maybe I would have done this to add the meeple right over here. Okay. Also, remember the exception with the boats. If you do play a boat with a meeple, the meeple must go to the boatsman. The only other rule that you need to know is that every tile can have at most one Viking on it. So as soon as this Viking goes on this tile, uh, A, it doesn't move and you can't add a, another meeple to that tile in the future, uh, even if it's the same color, right? But I could add a red one here if I wanted to. All right, next we're going to talk about the ship threatening and how that works. We're going to talk about the small scoring, which happens in at the end of rounds one, three, and five, as you can see with the icons over here. And then we're going to talk about the large scoring, which involves all the powers of all the Vikings. Okay, so um, let me teach you first about ship threatening and how this works. So during scoring, things are going to happen on your board, but if the Viking is threatened by a ship, its power will not occur. And the way ships threaten your board is you're going to draw a line between the ship's color 
and that color Viking and all the meeples that are in a row, all right, get laid down. All right. So for example, here, because it's blue, it's going to be all my Vikings on this line and none of them are going to activate because they're all threatened by that ship. All right. Same thing here. Red goes up to here, red meeple, and he would get laid down because he's being threatened by that ship. And for the section over here, all right, this is green. It won't reach this yellow because green is up to here. So it would be only this meeple over here. Now, the way that you stop the threatening ship is with the black meeples. All right. So for every black meeple that you have uh, protecting you, that's where you're going to have protection from the ship. So all of these could stand back up because they're not threatened anymore because the black one is protecting them. All right. In the future, I could add a black one there and this one would stand up, for example. All right, because I don't have a tile here or a black meeple here, this one would always be laid down, but this one is protected because the ship can't reach there far enough. All right, now let's talk about what happens during small scoring. So rounds one, three, and five, you're going to do a small scoring, and all you're going to do, look at the icon here, only the yellow meeples are going to score. So we're going to talk about all the powers of all the meeples later on, but during small scoring, each yellow meeple that you have that's standing up which means not threatened by a ship is going to score you three coins from the general supply so in this example here i have two so i'm going to take six coins from the general supply and add them to my personal supply all right the next thing we're going to talk about is the large scoring so this happens at the end of rounds two four and six you're going to tell by this icon over here and the way large scoring works is you're going to follow some very specific steps, but you're just going to go down the line over here on your player board. So the first thing you're going to do is activate your boatsman. All right. And what your boatsman allows you to do, so the gray meeples, is move meeples onto your islands. Okay. So you have two choices. One, move all the meeples of a specific color onto your islands or move one of each available color from the boat section up here onto your islands. So for example here, I can either move two red onto my islands, two yellow onto my islands, or one of each color. So let's just say I did uh, one of each color. So I would take these four and I would put them on my uh, islands. Okay. Placement rules are always in effect. So the colors matter. So you have to put always black on black, green on green, and all the other colors matter. I can place this one here or here. I can pretty much decide there. And this one I can place either here or here. Let's just say I want to put it there. All right. After you use a boatsman, they get discarded into the game box. Okay. So they're one time use. All right. And next you're going to go down the line. All right. Next is the ships. All right. So the ships and the warriors here work in tandem. Okay. So what happens is if a ship is uh, not blocked or repelled, it's called, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to gain the benefit from the top right. All it does is prevent uh, people from scoring. So for example, if this red one was here, I already talked about it during the threatening, he would just be laid down and not get any benefit in the large scoring. All right. Now, if he is repelled, for example, here, you're going to gain the benefit on the top right of the ship. So warriors help in two manners. They help protect your meeples below and they repel the ship so that you get the bonus in the top right. So here I would get three points. And for this one, I would get three coins. All right. And then you just keep going down the line. So your noble, which is a red, you're going to score two points for each noble, as long as they're not threatened. So in this case, I'll get six points. Whenever you get points, you just add them to your point track over here. After that, you have your scout. So each scout's going to score you one point. So there's going to be one extra point added to my track. And the way scouts work is you're going to also score one point for each fisherman and uh, goldsmith below him. So in this example here, he would score an extra point as well because there is a goldsmith right below him. All right, you only count the vertical below the uh, scout. All right, so if he was here, he would not gain the extra point. Next is the goldsmith. We already talked about it during small scoring. You're going to get three gold from the general supply. And lastly is the fisherman. This one we're going to talk about at the end game scoring because he has no effect during the game. All right, so after the final large scoring at the end of the sixth round, you're going to go straight to end game scoring. 
All right, before I talk about endgame scoring, there is one special rule in regards to the final scoring here. Uh, when you have to use your boatsmen, you must use them uh, if you can. All right? And the way you can sort of tell is that if you have colored meeples up here and there are places for them below, you have to use the boatsman. So for example here, I can use one boatsman here to add a yellow and a red to my tableau. So I can do something like this. All right? Now this one doesn't need to be placed because there's no space for them in my tableau. And this gets returned back to the box. Remember when you use them, they're gone. All right. After you do that special rule and do your regular large scoring, you're going to go straight to end game scoring. All right. For end game scoring, you're going to follow a unique step of uh, events here. So the first thing you're going to look at is the boats up here. And for each unrepelled boat, you're going to lose the value in the top right. Right, so normally you score what's in the top right, but you're going to lose it. So at the end of the game, for example, this one's unrepelled. You're going to lose five coins. For example, if this one wasn't here, you'll also lose three points. Next, after you do all of that, uh, for each five coins that you have in your supply, you're going to score a point. So just calculate it, divide by five, round it down. You'll score that many points on the point track. I did forget to mention, if you need to lose coins up here, and you don't have any coins left over, you're gonna straight up lose points uh, one for one. All right, so if I had no coins in my supply and I were to lose five coins, then I'd lose five points instead. All right, after that, you're gonna see between all the players who has the most boatsmen left. All right, whoever has the most is gonna get 10 points. For ties, you're all gonna get 10 points. So for example, if all the players had one, you're all gonna get 10 points on the track. After that, you're going to see who has the most completed islands. A completed island is an island with a beginning and an end. So for example, I only have two completed islands in my tableau. One here and one here. All right. Whoever has the most is going to get seven points. Next, you're going to see who has the longest island. So the longest island is, as you might think, the middle uh, beginning section, middle sections, and end section. So for example, here, my longest is four. Whoever has the longest is going to get five points. Again, those seven or five points can add on to the point track. And finally, now we're going to talk about the fishermen. So I haven't mentioned them throughout the whole video. And this is when they come into play. So the way fishermen work is they feed your other Vikings. All right, each fisherman is going to feed four Vikings. All right, the way I like to calculate this is just uh, sort of remove them from your board. So one, two, three, four. For example, you fed four uh, meeples with this fisherman. Now, for any other meeples that are unfed, you're going to lose one point per meeple. So, for example, one, two, three, four, you're going to lose four points on the point track. If you do overfeed, for example, if I had more than one uh, blue, and let's say this one wasn't here. So, this one would feed four more, but I only have three. For each extra food, you get two points. So, in this scenario here, I'll get two more points and you add it to the track. After you do all that, whoever has the most points is going to win the game. So those are all the rules to uh, the base game of Vikings. I'm going to talk about the advanced rules next. All right, so now let's talk about the advanced rules. All right, so there's a few changes to do during setup. Uh, the first change is you're going to use these special tiles. Uh, just mix them all up and make two stacks. One's going to go there and one's going to go there. And you're going to flip four off any of the stacks and you're going to put them in these slots over here. Okay, the rest of the game is gonna play like usual. You're gonna play the tiles exactly like normal. Remember the boats at the end and have the zero after the boats. Okay, and what the first player is gonna do is draw 13 Vikings out of the bag and sort them by color. All right, without placing them. Okay, now we're gonna do an auction for the new first player. Okay, so. The current first player is going to say a number, then the next person could beat it or pass, and then the person after that can beat it or pass, and you're going to keep going until everyone passes uh, and you have a high bid. All right, that person is going to pay the bank, so let's say he bid three, he's going to pay the bank, and he's going to become the new first player. So you're going to give him the first player ship, okay? And then he has to do a couple of steps. First is he takes one of the Vikings that are displayed uh, of the 13 and toss it out of the game. So any of them, it doesn't really matter. Well, it might matter for strategy, but let's say he doesn't want this green one in the game, so he tosses it out of the game. Okay. 
The next step that he has to do is pick one of the colors of Vikings and start placing them from the end, which is the 11th space working down. So let's say he picks uh, green and he starts from the 11th space and works his way down. So that was the first player. Now the next player, so second player is going to do the exact same thing, but pick a different color. So let's say you pick black, black's going to go. And let's say the next player goes, picks the uh, gray. Then the next player goes, picks the yellow. And then the next player goes, doesn't have a choice. It's going to be red. All right, so already you can tell there's a variable where the Vikings are going to be on the board. And the uh, sort of uh, first player is going to change every single round, uh, depending on some bids. All right. After this step, you're going to play the game exactly as per usual, except for two things. All right. During large scoring, a boatsman moves exactly one Viking no matter what. All right. He doesn't move all of one color. He doesn't move one of each color. It's one Viking. Second is if anyone ever buys the most valuable tile at that time, Right, so in this example, it'd be the 11, but you know, when you start rotating this, it could be less, but the most expensive tile on the board, that's when you pick up one of these special tiles. All right, so as soon as you get the tile, so let's say somebody were to pay this right away, they would take one of these tiles and activate their effect. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the effects of these tiles, they're in the book, but some are money, some are points uh, that you can get or money uh, when something happens. This is a point tile, so on and so on. All right, these tiles do not refresh right away. During the following round, you're gonna fill up the empty spaces with uh, new tiles. And that's about it. You're gonna play the game as per usual. Just remember, every single turn you're doing an auction and you're gonna be doing the placement of the Vikings around the board. Right? You can get special tiles if you buy the most expensive tile and the boatsman only moves one Viking.